Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Felix Ackermann. I'm really happy to welcome all of you and let me start with some technical information. And this discussion will be held in Belarusian and in English, and we have simultaneous translation uh, thanks to Alice Larvinets and Veronika Mazurkiewicz. I hope you are familiar with this function. You will find it um, in your um, on the bottom of your bar at the screen. There's uh, further information also in the chat if you will not find it. Very often, it's this function called interpretation is hidden behind three uh, three dots. Um, this uh, session will be recorded and later um, available via YouTube. Um, and it is organized by the Forum for Historical Research on Belarus. The forum itself is run by the DGO, German Association for East European uh, Studies, and uh, financed and supported by the uh, German Academic Exchange Service, uh, DRD. Let me just briefly introduce the forum um, itself. Um, it's, uh, it focuses on historical research on Belarus and understands itself as a platform for exchange on, Belarus, on Belarusian history and uh, its transnational context. Our partners are historians from Belarus who had to leave the country due to political repression and who now have to live in Germany, Poland, Lithuania and other countries within the European Union. We also are eager to be in touch with critically minded uh, historians who still live in Belarus. And of course, uh, among the participants of our forum are also historians from Germany and other countries inside of Europe um, whose research focuses on Belarus and its history. The forum offers uh, as tonight spaces for protected exchange, short uh, and furthermore short-term uh, scholarships for young research and opportunities for conferences and public online discussions like the one tonight. And I'm very happy um, to just um, remind that there's a steering com committee I'm I'm a member of, and that's why I'm actually opening this tonight. Um, and I'm very glad that we collaborate there with Tatiana Ostrowskaya, Irina Kastalian, uh, Simon Lewis, Viktor Shodulski, and uh, Annika Walke. Today, we will discuss 85 years of uh, after the Hitler-Stalin Pact, consequences uh, and remembrance in Belarus, Lithuania and Ukraine. And I'm really happy that we are able to contextualize Belarus today in a broader context and to include Lithuanian and Ukrainian perspectives. That's something new we didn't manage to do before. And I'm really looking forward um, that uh, Lucia Verbechkene, Alexander Smolenchuk and Denise Shatalov, um, who has, himself is now in Kriverik um, uh, um, in Ukraine, uh, joined us for this discussion. And I will hand over in a minute uh, to Christoph Meissner. He is working at Berlin uh, Karlshorst Museum, and he uh, has a uh, he just spent intensive years uh, as a curator of the exhibition Rift Through Europe, the consequences of the Hitler-Stalin Pact, uh, and um, he <clears throat> he organized this uh, exhibition in a particularly participative way by inviting scholars from all uh, societies, actually, um, which. Um, we are part of the zone of influence uh, divided by the Soviet Union and Germany. And he just received a copy uh, with essays of colleagues uh, who participated in this project. And I was also happy to join one of the seminars actually where he and Anke Hilbrenner invited students to comment an early version of this exhibition. So I'm really glad that now this exhibition is available for visitors and the general public in Berlin uh, Museum Karlshorst. Uh, Christoph Meissner, the floor is yours. Dear Felix, uh, thank you for the kind introduction and um, thank you to the audience, to everybody who joined us uh, tonight for this uh, webinar. Um, it's, um, it's for me a pleasure to introduce um, the participants of our, our panel discussion and I will start with uh, Lucia Bevichkiene. Um, she is an assistant professor and researcher at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science at the Vilnius University in Lithuania. She is also a postdoctoral research fellow at the Lithuanian Institute of History. Her research interests uh, cover interdisciplinary memory studies, memory of the 20th century occupations of Lithuania, 
partisans war memory and entanglements of uh, memory politics after the regime change. She is currently analyzing discourses of collaborationism that take place after 1990 in Lithuania. And she also takes part in the EU Horizon Videra project, Facing the Past, Public History for a Stronger Europe. Lucia, thank you that you're with us today. Um, the uh, second one is uh, Alexander Smajanchuk. Um, he is a professor at the Institute of Slavic Studies at the Polish Academy of Science. His research interests are anthropological uh, oriented history, national relations in Belarus and Lithuania in the 19th and 20th century, the social history of Belarus in the, in the, uh, in the 19th and 20th century, and the study of collective and cultural memory and oral history and the editing of historical sources. He published various books on the events of uh, autumn 1939 in Eastern Poland and Belarus. And I'd like, like to mention two important compilations of documents. Um, the one is Liberated and Oppressed, Polish Belarusian Borderlands in 1939 to 1941 in the documents of Belarusian uh, archives from 2023. And the second one is Behind the First Councils, the Polish Belarusian uh, border 1939 to 1941 in the oral memories of the inhabitants of Belarus. Alexander, nice to have you here. And the third one is uh, Denis Shatalov. Um, he obtained his PhD in history in 2016 uh, from the Oles uh, Honcha Dnipro National University in Ukraine with a thesis on Ukrainian Cossacks in uh, public discourses from the second half of the 18th to the first half of the 19th century. From 2015 on, he is a research fellow at the Ukrainian Institute for Holocaust Studies and the Jewish Mem Memory and Holocaust in Ukraine Museum. And um, he is also a member of the War Migration and Memory Research Group at the Forum uh, Transregionale Studien. And since October 2024, he is a uh, non-resident Gerda Henkel uh, Stiftung uh, Fellow at the Forum Transregionale Studien. Since 2022, Dennis is focusing uh, on his research project titled The War and This War, the Entanglement and Interaction of Imagination, Commemoration and Memory of World War II and the Ongoing War in Ukraine. Along with his engagement in memory and memory politics studies, he is also conducting research in the history of the Cossack myth. And his recent publications, including the single veteran batch for two wars, Appropriation of the Great Patriotic War, uh, commemoration heritage in the context of the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war and uh, intertwined memories in Krivirich, the ATO, uh, Second World War and the Cossacks from 2023. Dennis, uh, thank you that you're with us. So um, actually, um, the, I asked um, all three participants to give us a short uh, introduction into the um, events that happened in 1939, 1940, um, because I think and uh, it, it would be valuable for our discussion to have the historic background in, in order to switch over later uh, later on to the memory of this um, of these uh, events in uh, nowadays or uh, nowadays Belarus, Lithuania and uh, Ukraine. So um, I would like to um, start with um, Alexander, um, that you give us uh, five minutes, maximum five minutes uh, introduction into the events that happened in 1939 in the autumn of 1939 in, in, in today's Belarus and uh, back then um, um, Poland and Belarus. Thank you. Dear Christoph, at the very beginning, I, I, I'm not running uh, just uh, the Institute of the Belarusian uh, Institute for Public History. I represent it just sorry uh, talking about the uh, 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 Molotov Ribbentrop uh, Pact. Uh, we should talk first about the terminology. Yes, in uh, Belarus, there there is a, such a term of a um, uh, concept of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. But uh, we should, um, you know, from historical point of view, we should talk about uh, Hitler-Stalin Pact because they were the main players. And when we talk about uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and its consequences for Belarus, we don't uh, t uh, bear in mind not the document itself, but the secret, uh, secret protocol uh, to, to it. 
and what what was behind this secret protocol for belarus when we talk uh, about uh, about belarus first of all uh, we have to underline that the pact and its uh, secret um, uh, protocol and the soviet uh, aggression on the 17th of september um 1930 Nine uh, uh, against Poland uh, meant uh, the Bel Belarus Belarus entry into the Second World War. It, not entry, but uh, the fact that the war started for Belarus. And uh, talking about the the minimalistic uh, um, uh, estimations, uh, Belarus lost two uh, more than two million uh, persons, and these um, events were tragic for each family. And uh, personally, I uh, read a, a, a number of uh, um, uh, research uh, with my uh, colleagues as well. So there were no family uh, across Belarus that would not have its own tragic memory about this world war. And it, it was not uh, only ab about the uh, victims, about the uh, German uh, occupation, but uh, people also remembered uh, the victims of the uh, Stalinist repressions in the uh, 1930s and after the war as well. At the same time, uh, one has to underline that uh, um, as a result of this war uh, that uh, was, uh, well, as a story, uh, the Belarusian lands were unified and uh, on the 14th of um, November uh, uh, 1939, the Soviet uh, Supreme Council of the uh, Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic uh, um, adopted uh, well, um, uh, the decision about uh, extending the territory. So uh, the um, uh, more than uh, um, uh, 100,000 square kilometers and uh, um, uh, were included and the population grew by uh, 4. million people. Well, today's uh, Republic of Belarus is more or less has more or less the same borders um, uh, of um, uh, that were established at that time. This is a positive uh, uh, a positive de development uh, for the state, and we have distinguished this uh, state uh, history from the history of nations. Well, we have to bear in mind also the context. How? Um, uh, uh, what were uh, uh, how came this uh, unification and what were its consequences and when we talk about uh, these events we um, uh, uh, we have to bear in mind the materials of oral history it shows uh, they showed that it was a tra tragic uh, history first of all when uh, people recall these uh, uh, years we had our expeditions from 2016 to 2017. People remembered repressions that dominated across uh, across uh, um, uh, Belarus. So, well, the symbol of these repressions are Kurapati, a small village uh, near Minsk where there were mass uh, killings. And the next uh, aspect is the Sovietization of the civic life and social life. And people uh, quickly realized that this regime that came uh, is based on two pillars. First, the propaganda, and uh, in other uh, words, uh, lies. And in in second second pillar is uh, the violence, uh, the uh, force, brutal force against people. And people um, and these uh, two pillars are reflected in people's uh, memories. And this tragic. Uh, tragedy is very uh, frequent in the uh, 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 in the memories of people that the war cannot be a tool of solving any problems solving any uh, political or whatever whatever problems it was uh, um, uh, it, it was contradicting the soviet dogma and uh, what is still on now in uh, uh, Russian or Belarusian, Belarusian regime propaganda. So uh, there were a different uh, uh, vision of the war from today's propaganda. And another aspect, uh, remembering uh, what happened uh, um, after molotov ribbentrop Pact, it was the beginning of the massive Russification, Sovietization on the territory of the Western Belarus. Here, so the uh, there is now a uh, clear answer, and uh, on the one hand, uh, there is a unification of the Belarusian lands, but 
uh, at the same time a strong a, st a, a, a strong um, a hit over um, a strong uh, a, a, a str strong um, uh, a, a, a strong strike over on the Belarusian national movement. So this unification came with the um, was the order of the so-called so Soviet uh, Stalinist uh, um, camp order. Well, that's it uh, uh, for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Alexander. Um, actually, um, probably I should um, give a small um, introduction now because it was not mentioned. So uh, on 1st of September, um, on 23rd of August, uh, the German Reich and the Soviet Union uh, made this pact, uh, which is called Hitler-Stalin Pact, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Um, one week later, on 1st of September, um, the German uh, army um, attacked um, Poland from the western part, and two um, weeks later, the Soviet army marched in uh, the eastern part of Poland. And then uh, it came to a division of uh, Poland. Um, so, and uh, this is what uh, Alexander also said now, the reunification of uh, Belarus uh, was taking part because the Soviet uh, Union uh, occupied one part and um, handed it over to the Belarusian uh, Soviet um, Socialist Republic and another part uh, to the uh, Ukrainian um, Socialist Soviet Republic. And um, this is why I would like to uh, go now to uh, Denise and ask him, is this, uh, re uh, is this unification um, also important for the uh, Ukrainian um, um, way of thinking? But first of all, let's, um, let's uh, stay with the, uh, with the historical um, facts and um, please tell us what happened in the case of Ukraine in 1939-14. Christoph, uh, thank you very much, uh, Christoph, uh, uh, and my thanks to the organizers for this experiment that uh, we talk, uh, uh, we use English, uh, Belarusian, and uh, English and Ukrainian language. As for the U Ukrainian context of the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, uh, well, well, this context is similar to the Belarusian one. On the 1st of uh, uh, September, the um, uh, war outbreaks uh, uh, on the territory of Belarus, the Luftwaffe bombed the cities of Western Ukraine, and Ukrainians, uh, dwellers of the uh, Poland at that time, uh, about uh, 120,000 um, uh, Ukrainians were drafted in the uh, Polish army at that time, and next, on the 7th of September, uh, there is a so-called Ukrainian-Soviet front. The strategic unification uh, took place. And uh, also, uh, this uh, army um, had a, a high percentage of Ukrainians that advanced uh, on the territory of Poland, uh, um, attacking Poland, and they take the relevant uh, the sphere of the Soviet interest. After, after that, the, the same story of the people's assemblies uh, in the Western Ukraine as in Belarus. And it leads to uh, the, the uh, incorporation in the Soviet Union. Next, the same history is the brutal uh, Sovietization uh, no political uh, freedoms, uh, uh, well, no uh, private property rights, uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, well, deportation of uh, uh, different layers of society to Kazakhstan, to other uh, uh, territories, from uh, even uh, all, uh, all, also the expulsion of, of Jews and Ukrainians from the occupied uh, German territories. On the other hand, this pact was uh, the uh, the pact, but not but this unification. On the same uh, 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 hand, was uh, the um, realization of dreams of about unity of many Ukrainian national uh, uh, activists, uh, starting from um, dreams developed uh, in 19th century. 
from the very beginning that I would like to add another consequence that in the Ukrainian case, the incorporation of, uh, of the, uh, uh, by the Soviet Union of these lands uh, were combined with the annexation of uh, uh, of northern Bukovina and Bessarabia at the expense of Romania. And uh, these were also the ethnic Ukrainian uh, lands. And Bessarabia, the, nowadays uh, Moldova is as well. Uh, for Ukraine, this, uh, con con these consequences were also important because, well, it was not a part of the national narrative at that time. So uh, that as a result of the Soviet administrative uh, reforms, there were no longer a mold of uh, Ottoman Republic uh, of Moldova inside Ukraine. So um, there was uh, the Soviet Socialist Republic of Moldova that was created separate, separate one from Ukraine. That's it for now. Mm. Thank you, Dennis. Um, I think it gave a brief, uh, and now we can already see the similarities between the Belarus and uh, and Ukraine. And um, now the question is, uh, how is it with the um, <laughs> with the Lithuanian um, part? Because uh, first of all, um, as I mentioned, um, the eastern part of Poland was uh, occupied by the Soviet Union, and later on, the Soviet Union uh, um, handed over um, to Lithuania um, the Vilnius district. And uh, but this was like a bitter pill because uh, it was uh, it came along with the deployment of uh, of uh, twenty five thousand uh, Soviet soldiers. But I don't want to. Um, say uh, too much about this because I want to give you, Lucia, the uh, word and uh, please uh, explain us if maybe the reunification is also a uh, kind of motto that helps uh, in understanding the uh, Lithuanian um, part. Many thanks, Christoph, also for the kind uh, introduction and invitation. So I think I will start with a few dates and some of those dates were already mentioned. So why do I start with the dates and events? So in general timing, when we are talking about the Hitler-Stalin Pact, or in Lithuania, we call it Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, events that followed it, and later the outbreak of war between the USSR and Germany, and uh, the occupations, uh, the, the Soviet and German, and then again the Soviet occupation of Lithuania, so timing is crucial. Many events, including devastating events, uh, took place in a very short period of time. So the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact in its secret protocols that are so important to all those countries um, and whose representatives are, are here today, uh, in fact, appointed Lithuania at first to the influence zone of Germany. However, there were some amendments in September and it was agreed that it will go under the influence of USSR. So later, as we know, the tension between the two powers increased. However, in 1940, it was still very much unclear how the situation of Lithuania will look like. And of course, all attention was paid to Poland, later to France, and including, of course, attention of, of the West. So um, I think the most dramatical, well, we would agree that the most dramatical event followed um, and the situation changed dramatically when USSR issued ultimatum to Lithuanian government in June 1940, demanding allowance for Soviet military forces to enter and, of course, the military bases to be built in the sovereign, uh, then sovereign country of Lithuania. And a in the evening before uh, accepting, in fact, the ultimatum, a uh, Lithuanian government were harshly discussing what to do. And there were disagreements whether to resist in military terms or to accept the ultimatum. And knowing the uneven power balance, of course, uh, and many other factors, the cabinet of ministers disagreed on how to react and 
in finally the ultimatum was accepted and uh, the president left for the west and the troops the soviet troops entered um, uh, almost immediately the puppet government was established uh, of course we have to acknowledge that some of well known left leaning lithuanian figures were part of this part of of of, of the puppet go government but nevertheless a um, huge propaganda campaign followed freedom of speech was restricted persecution of political opponents started the wave of arrests and repressions followed step by step and a peak of the repressions took place in june already in june in 1941 when about 17600 were sentenced and sent to siberia so including families with small children and in this wave of deportations, uh, Lithuania lost many members of previous elite, including political cultural elite, members of intelligentsia, teachers, businessmen, many people whom we would call today members of civil society and including young people, young activists in various political organizations, also uh, members of Catholic uh, communities and so on. So once again, the timing, because only a week after this massive wave of deportations and prosecutions, the war between USSR and Germany starts, resulting actually in the German occupation of Lithuania in the summer, the same summer of 1941. So to sum up, major consequences of those events. So first of all, loss of sovereignty and statehood for about 50 years and we regained independence in 1990. And we gained Vilnius back, the capital of Lithuania, but it's an ironic trade-off getting the capital, but losing the sovereignty. Of course, traumatic losses that involved almost every family in Lithuania, as, as colleagues also mentioned, as was the case in, in, in Belarus and Ukraine, repressions, prosecution, deportations, a high number of losses, including the elite and elite to be, so the the young activists, increased distrust uh, in the society, anger, fear, and uh, knowing that the occupations followed one after another, and of course the link to the crimes against humanity that were conducted on our soul. Of course, we had to acknowledge also the involvement of, of our uh, citizens uh, to the events that took place there during the German occupation, the loss of the, the Jewish community, the Holocaust. So all this is also linked to 1939, 40, and finally 41. And of course, the Sovietization that followed and with the so-called uh, second Soviet occupation uh, in 1944. So I think that's it for the introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucia. Um, so um, um, what we've seen now is that um, this um, what of Ribbentrop Pact, um, as Lucia mentioned, the secret protocol of this pact had a huge impact on the societies of, uh, um, of various states and um, especially what we are discussing today on uh, Ukraine, uh, Belarus and uh, Lithuania. So it was, and uh, this was what every three of our speakers mentioned, um, it was, uh, it affected almost every family, almost every uh, person in this uh, in these countries in that time and um while it had this that strong impact on the societies it is now remembered um in the societies and um there uh, i would like to switch over now from the historic facts um to the remembrance nowadays or just to the remembrance after 1991 when all these countries regained sovereignty and uh could develop their own way of uh, commemorating this event. And um, so the next question uh, that I would like to raise uh, to all three speakers, because I think it is various in uh, in all countries, um, that um, how is the remembrance um, since the collapse of the Soviet Union? And especially uh, keep an eye, please, on the uh, 
actors uh, in this commemoration and how different groups uh, commemorated. And um, if you like, you can also um, speak about the politics of uh, remembrance that may be uh, defer from the um, public commemoration of the events. Um, and um, as we know, all the Baltic Way, maybe, uh, which was a human chain uh, from Vilnius to um, to um, Tallinn, that was uh, built in uh, on 28, uh, 23rd of uh, August uh, 1989, on the 50th anniversary of the of the um, pact. Uh, I would like to start with um, um, with the case of um, Lithuania now, um, how it is rem remembered um, after 1991. Um, and which actors uh, do we see? Uh, thank you very much, Christoph, for mentioning the Baltic Way. And we have to say that uh, memories of the uh, persecutions, of repressions and deportations, memories of the victims and their family members were very important in the whole freedom movement uh, that took place a place in Lithuania, the so-called Sayudas movement. So even before the reestablishment of the independence uh, in 1990, we uh, the, the commemorations already took place and the memories were uh, published, memoirs were published, lots of information was became open to the public about the repressions. <laughs> But of course, after 1990, the, the whole culture of remembrance developed and um, uh, important actors, of course, there were the unions, the associations of former political prisons, prisoners, dissidents, deportees. So the, the victims and at the same time, the, the fighters for freedom. But what I observed while looking at the commemorations from 1990, so the first sort of decade of commemorations, so lots, a, a lot of narratives about victimhood and Lithuania being victim of the great powers, uh, repressions and persecutions and so on. But later on, from 2010, I would say, much more emphasis during commemoration and official remembrance culture was put on fighting, on resisting. So from victimhood, sort of passive victim, to active involvement in resistance. Uh, the partisan war memory, uh, so fighting for freedom, so that change sort of changed and to some extent replaced the victim narrative. So uh, importance on on the on the resistance was made, and here we, again we have we have activists. We also have scholars, historians who promote the the memory of the partisan war. We also have. Uh, political party that is very important, uh, so the relevant political party, whose identity is based on memory of the Soviet time and of this idea of fighting for freedom and uh, uh, the supporters of this political party are are those who, who who did oppose the system and who were very much against against the Soviet rule or consider themselves as being very much against uh, the, the Soviet rule. So we have many players, in fact, but we have quite a unified version of the past. So the victim, but later on also the fighter, the resistant, the nation who resisted. So I think in short, it would be it. Yeah, thank you for this brief overview, and um, that I that I would like to hand over now um, to Dennis. And um, I can imagine that it's maybe a bit different in, in Ukraine and the first decade of uh, of the uh, of the remembrance after the collapse of the Soviet Union in uh, in the uh, end of nineteen ninety one. So please, Dennis, um, please say us something about Ukrainian's case in this first decade. Thank you, Christoph. Так. Український випадок, він трохи інший. Чому? Бо... О, ну, більш... The Ukrainian case is slightly different because the nostalgia on the Soviet Union was uh, more, was harder. Uh, 
this, this part of Ukraine that was uh, uh, the, the part of Ukraine that was under the uh, uh, Soviet occupation, they treated Molotov Ribbentrop Pact um, as uh, something that uh, was um, uh, uh, was part of the Soviet history, but uh, it was it, it, they, they, that was the mainstream idea that it was some car, sort of agreement. Uh, and uh, no one put it central as the uh, beginning of the uh, Second World War. Uh, uh, they spoke about the Great Patriotic War, where the Ukrainians, as part of the Soviet Union, uh, fought the, uh, uh, the Nazi Germany, and uh, the Nazi Germany uh, was uh, breaching this pact of Molotov-Ribbentrop, the peaceful pact. That was the mainstream idea. But uh, the Western Ukraine, they have a different attitude to this. Uh, when uh, I, I can echo my colleagues because they uh, recollect the repressions that followed, uh, the repressions and the change in lifestyle uh that followed uh for the next five or ten years uh i think it's important to say that uh, the uh, memory of people did not focus on um the uh did not focus on this particular event because it was uh, there were many events like uh the activities of ukrainian nationalists and those events uh, took place till uh, 1950s it was very intense um so the the, the first sovietization uh, and the second sovietization start in 1944 so um then the the topic of uh, molot of ribbentrop pact was not that much important in this context uh, but its role became more uh, studied, more important after 2014 um, in Ukraine. And gradually, uh, uh, this pact, Stalin-Hitler pact, um, after uh, 2014, started being more and more criticized. And in school textbooks, um, for instance, it was described as uh, the, uh, uh, the Stalin-Hitler pact was a um, uh, pact between two aggressors who uh, divided Europe uh, and started the Second World War. But uh, it also allowed Ukraine to get united. The, uh, the lands of the Western and Eastern Ukraine got uh, into the same country. Uh, so you see, uh, sort of it was uh, criticized, but in the Ukrainian context, it was uh, not so much criticized. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Um, and um, as we um, as we heard before, that the Ukrainian Belarusian part um, or just the cases are slightly the same in uh, in the in the in the terms of the historical um, um, facts. Um, I would like to ask Alexander now: um, Does this also refer to the um, to the memory? Is this also the same, like in uh, in 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 Ukraine, or do you? Um, or do you see there different, different major differences between those two countries? Father Denis recognized the first and second Soviet Denis recognized the first and the second Sovietization. This is what I am going to start with. Uh, in one uh, of the conversations with uh, people who witnessed that, uh, who witnessed first and second Soviet. And uh, this person replied that the first Soviets were better because they disappeared fast. And the second ones, they came and they stayed. So uh, here I'll start with the Soviet narrative, uh, the Soviet ideology narrative. 
uh, put uh, September of uh, 1939 um, as following. They said that there was no secret um, attachment to this um, uh, agreement. So this was a liberation operation of the Red Army that was liberating Western Belarus from uh, Polish occupation. And um, I, in, in Russian and uh, Belarusian media, uh, uh, they also even now say that uh, those lands were liberated from uh, uh, Polish and from uh, German occupation, even though it was an agreement between the Soviets and the Germans. In Belarus, uh, the rethinking of this event uh, started even before 1990, uh, in the end of 1980s. Uh, the, uh, when I recollect those times, and I'm a bit older than my uh, colleagues, um, I remember this time, it was quite a freedom at that time. Uh, in 1980s, in the end of 1980s, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. Uh, and we did not have enough access to documents, but we could think and we could voice what we were thinking. In 1991, uh, first Belarusian textbooks of independent Belarus appeared and they spoke about this uh, secret agreement uh, and that it influenced on the beginning of the uh, um, Second World War. But uh, September 17th was not part of it, sort of. It was a positive date in those textbooks. Uh, the authors of textbooks said that it was very good that Belarus got united. And there was one phrase that, yeah, there were repressions and the uh, command and administrative system was not perfect. Uh, but um, only like local authorities did it. Still, uh, the beginning of 1990s was uh, the beginning of building Belarusian narrative. Uh, it was the historical policy that uh, was rethinking those events. Uh, still, uh, in 1994, we had uh, presidential elections when Lukashenko won, and uh, the Soviet narrative was back. Those um, new textbooks were destroyed, and we got back to the old Soviet point of view on history. Mm, uh, for some time, uh, even for a long time, uh, historians managed to preserve uh, this um, uh, balance. Uh, and uh, for, for, but for instance, now they mention the secret uh, uh, agreement, but they say it was a good thing because uh, the aggression of Germany against USSR started two years later and they, that the Soviet Union had uh, two more years to get prepared for the war against uh, the Nazi Germany. This is interesting. And another thing that is interesting um, in the textbooks is that the secret agreement divided Europe into two spheres of influence, Germany and uh, United States. So the authors say that it, it was good that Germany and the uh, Soviet Union had the full right to divide Europe into spheres of influence, unfortunately. As for alternative historic policy or the position of the Belarusian society, it's not that uh, clear as well. Now, uh, no discussions in Belarus are possible. Uh, but uh, into 2009, 70 years anniversary of the unification of Belarus, there were quite loud discussions in the Belarusian society. Uh, and two concepts don dominated. The first concept was that uh, people saying, were saying that the importance of the history for the state is central. The context is not important. What is important that Belarus was united. And uh, the other point of view was um, different. The, I support the, the other point of view. And 
it was saying that the context is uh, important. Uh, there is a there is a history of a country of a political state, and there is a, a history of a nation of people, and they are not different. They should not contradict each other. The interests of the state should not contradict the interests of the people. If the war is evil, we should speak about it. Um, I think that the Belarusian society, independent society, does not have one uh, point of view on the on these events. Uh, if we understood in the end of the uh, 1980s what happened uh, in the Western Belarus after uh, this mode of Ribbentrop Pact, if we understood it fully, we would not go through what we are going through right now. It, we would be a different um, society. Another thing I would mention is a communication memory. Uh, they, uh, this communication memory of um, families of generations, it was it was contrary to what was said by uh, by the TV or textbooks. So this communication memory was a memory about the tragedy. If people were speaking about the Red Army, they, they were saying mainly Russians came and uh, they were met with flowers. And then they said very fast, those flowers faded. Um, all the memories uh, that uh, I was recording they were saying that in two months the attitude to the to the red army changed and in two months even if they welcomed them with flowers uh, they started uh, waiting for them to leave uh, 70,000 Belarusians joined the uh, Polish army to protect army just like the uh, the uh, Ukrainians, what Denise mentioned. So people hoped that Poles would be back. And then in 1941, the, uh, there were German, uh, there was German occupation and the, the history became even more tragic. So I think uh, I used all my time. Yeah, thank you, Alexander. Um, and I think we see already the differences um, between these uh, three cases um, that we have tonight here. Um, and actually, while this is, um, I would like to go now into some maybe a hot topic that is um, related to the um, to the um, effects on on uh, on the um, internal and external policies um, of these countries. Does this commemoration, um, maybe we can also um, speak about the foreign policy uh, first because our time is running, and uh, but I think this is the most sensitive uh, issue. Um, does this uh, consequences of the um, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact and uh, its, its commemoration nowadays um, have consequences in the foreign uh, policies? And I would, I would like to stress um, maybe the, the two elephants in the room that are not uh, with us, but it's uh, Poland and Russia. Um, so, with um, do this um, memory affects um, the foreign policy uh, towards Russia, towards Poland, and uh, if you can, just um, also um, try to um, stick a bit in the Polish perspective if you can do this. Um, and um, I would like to start um, with um, Alexander. I mean, you had the word; you, <laughs> I gave you the word, um, and afterwards we go into. Uh, to uh, Lucia and then we to Dennis, okay? The Molotov Ribbentrop Pact and its uh, uh, um, uh, consequences, the 7th of uh, September and the whole year of 1939 is an important topic for the Belarusian foreign policy. Uh, in uh, June um, uh, 2021, Alexander Lukashenko signed a decree about a new uh, uh, on the 7th of June uh, a new um, uh, a new holiday for Belarus, uh, the National Unity Day on the September 7th, uh, that has been already celebrated for three times. And analyzing this celebration, 
this celebration makes Poland uh, enemy number one. Well, this uh, celebration has anti-Polish and anti-Western anti -Western, uh, character. And I think that the Belarusian uh, um, Belarusian authorities uh, uh, took, uh, uh, to some extent, uh, uh, precedence from a similar day uh, in Russia. They uh, commemorated on November of the 4th in memory of liberation of Moscow by Minin and Pozharsky militia from the troops of Polish-Lithuanian uh, Commonwealth. And it has also anti-Polish and anti-Western meaning. And this uh, uh, this uh, uh, celebration, a very important one, uh, uh, is uh, uh, generously funded, and uh, th 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 there are uh, two most grandiose um, uh, uh, holidays or days um, uh, celebrated in Belarus: so the uh, 9th of May. The victory of the Soviet Union over the Nazi Germany, uh, even if it is celebrated on the 8th of May by uh, allies. And the next day is September 7th as the National Unity Day. And this is a very politically biased, and they use uh, they have political use of these events today. As for how it is perceived by people, it's difficult to assess because we cannot have uh, um, uh, opinion polls there. From my, my personal context and from what I read, uh, this anti-Polish uh, rhetoric is not very e efficient. Uh, it is kind of a, a forced uh, uh, celebration for Belarusians. So people are obliged by their bosses, they do that, uh, some ritual. But uh, as a matter of fact, there is a, a, a certain uh, independence of thinking among Belarusians, and still there are uh, rather large contacts still with uh, Poles. People continue to travel to Poland, uh, have relatives, uh, uh, people, uh, well, their family members or friends. So. Uh, uh, this uh, ideological vision is not uh, uh, still winning. I think on the second plan, uh, of course, we have Russia. Well, uh, I mentioned already the Russian National Unity Day and their interpretation, but uh, of course, they don't have uh, uh, Stalin, but still the Stalin is at the background as somebody who united the Soviet Union and Belarus as well. And unfortunately, these events are, I would say, uh, produce uh, these very bad events that uh, spoil the relations between uh, Belarusians and Poles, Belarus and Poland. Hey, thank you, uh, Alexander. Uh, so we see that in uh, Belarus, the um, this um, commemoration is highly used uh, in a political way. And um, Lucia, um, I would like to ask you also: um, Is it the same case in in, in Lithuania that you use uh, commemoration politics um, for internal and external politics, or is it just uh, in um, more um, civil society commemoration? Oh, I think it's a very, very complex issue. So I would say that I would maybe jump to the, to the also to current events, uh, to the Ukrainian war. But even before that, before that, uh, the annexation of Crimea that had an impact also on how memory is used in 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 state in state politics and state identity politics and state foreign politi policy policies uh, that's where we observe the strong link between security and memory and it's not directly the memory of the molotov ribbentrop pact that is at stake here but rather what is actually linked to is the memory of the partisan war uh, the Lithuanian Partisan War from 1944 to 1953, so resisting the 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 Russian uh, the Russian occupation that that is considered and was con and is still considered as a target. So the memory as a target of the Russian uh, propaganda and participation in the information war from 2014 actually meant that 
memory has to be defended. So we scholars, I think we criticized a little bit this link of memory and security, saying that um, we need to be resilient, we need to resist this pressure of going into information war, and um, that foreign propaganda targets what's sensitive in the, in the society and the memory of partisan war. So resisting uh, Soviet troops is actually a controversial memory. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so the link between memory and uh, security was, was established in 2014. But I would like to go back a little bit to the relationship to with Poland and with uh, with Russia later. So in terms of Poland, I think lots of effort uh, were put from both political elites in Lithuania and Poland, but also from civil society and various organizations to ease the historical tensions that relate to the question of Vilnius and Vilnius district that belonged to Poland in, in the interwar period and later or was taken back to, to, to Lithuania. So to ease those historical tensions. And I think that those efforts uh, have contributed to the relationship and the strong relationship that we have today. And the common threat, addressing the common threat from the East, I think also makes this cooperation stronger. Of course, there were tensions, uh, there were some, I don't know, within the, the Polish minority, but I think that also the promotion and uh, financing of Polish schools in, in Vilnius, for instance, and uh, close cooperation between those schools with, and, and, and Polish uh, Polish society is is very 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 important, and I think that historical tensions do, now don't play much, and the cooperation is 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 evident. However, of course, in terms of 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 the um, of Russia, and uh, it's always been complicated. Although there have been sort of less intense periods of time in those three decades after nineteen ninety one. But uh, it was, it still is rather complicated. So this link of security and memory, that memory has to be defended, of course, concerns Russia. And, and um, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's very, very, very complicated. But I would say that it also gives the background of, to unify, to unite the country and to to promote the identity of the country that has resisted and is ready to resist just in case it will be needed. Um, thank you, Lucia. And I think it's uh, it's a good um a good point now to switch over to Dennis. Um actually you're facing uh, a big aggression from uh, from Russia and um we all with you. That's that you should be sure about it. Um, and um, anyway, I from my perspective, it seems also that uh, there is a um, stronger link now to Poland uh, becoming uh, because of this aggression. Um, but maybe this is only my impression, and uh, I would like to hand over it uh, to you. And um, maybe you can um, uh, elaborate it from your perspective. Yeah, so Christoph, no, uh, uh, thank you, Christoph. Well, uh, if we speak about a Molotov Ribbentrop Pact and its influence on the international uh, relations and politics, I think that uh, yeah, as for Ukrainian Polish relations, it does not influence much because Ukraine officially. Uh, does not uh, it, it condemns the brutal division of Poland, but there is a sensitive point that uh, this uh, split of Poland uh, also contributed to the uh, gaining of territory by Ukraine. Still, we ign ignore this fact. Even the events of the last two weeks uh, showed that Ukrainian Polish relations. Um, uh, have uh, 
at center uh, the Ukrainian nationalism uh, um, and Ukrainian um, rebel army. Uh, the Evelyn events uh, are more important and more central for uh, Ukrainian-Polish relations than Molotov uh, uh, Ribbentrop Pact. So the massive, uh, ma massive ethnic cleansing uh, that were conducted by Ukrainian nationalists, uh, they uh, they are discussed on the uh, uh, official level as well as the deportation of uh, ethnic Ukrainians uh, from uh, at the Polish territory. So this event is more uh, uh, important for Ukrainian-Polish relations. As for the Russian uh, perspective, since 2014, um, Russia, in the uh, historic perspective, uh, both in the everyday uh, communication and historic policy, it is associated with the Soviet Union, and um, it is uh, and its uh, dictatorship, uh, the dictatorship um, nature of the Stalin regime, is extrapolated to the, uh, the modern Putin regime. Um, so uh, it also um, uh, is uh, true for the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So it's it's not only the international level, but also the mentality of Ukrainians, and um, the the uh, date uh, the, the uh, 2014 as the first stage of this uh, hybrid war in Ukraine, and um, especially in the eastern and uh, southern parts of Ukraine. They, uh, there used to be a lot of people with uh, Soviet nostalgia and uh, uh, and uh, good relations toward Russia, but the events of um, 2014, uh, this um, historic provocation, uh, they, they could understand that well. The Soviet uh, Union was not that good. Uh, the, and Russia is not that good. So this uh, appreciation of the Soviet uh, Union and Soviet nostalgia was uh, fought. So we, we don't face it uh, at, at that uh, scale any longer. There is a transformation of uh, uh, the attitudes toward the past by Ukrainians. Uh, so it, it happened uh, both because of the uh, the policy of national memory of the Ukrainian government, and also because of the aggression of, of the Russian aggression. Because Russia today is associated with the Soviet Union, um, uh, and um, they uh, of course say that the Kremlin is, is to blame. Thank you, uh, Denise, for this um, um, interesting insights. And um, I would like to encourage all of our uh, participants in this uh, this webinar uh, to write your uh, questions in the uh, Q and A uh, section. Um, but before we will answer on them, I would like to have one more questions to our panelists. Um, because um, I would like to come back from this culture of remembrance uh, um, to the sources, um, because uh, we historians, we are working with sources and um, we have to deal with uh, propaganda in the sources, we have to deal with uh, false information in the sources, we have to deal with reality and how can we elaborate what is uh, in the sources, what is true, what is not true, um, and uh, to what extent help us um, um, the different oral history projects, because this is uh, uh, the, the the Belarusian um, historical uh, um, oral history project is really important for the um, for this forum here as well. And Alexander, you are um, um, a big um, participant in this project. Maybe you can tell us something about how this is uh, for the Belarusian case um, the, the case. Uh, online, Belarusian online oral history archive uh, was founded in 2011, uh, but I had uh, researches of oral history even before from the uh, end of 90s. 
1990s. And talking about the uh, um, sources in general, my book was uh, dedicated to the changes. So this, the, 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 this book, this book liberated and oppressed. So it was um, uh, written on the basis of uh, documents uh, from the national archives and uh, uh, from the documents of different organizations. And these are mostly government uh, documents. I had only uh, access to uh, the uh, documents of the Soviet officials, of the Soviet administration with the relevant interpretation of what happened. And researcher should uh, keep distance uh, have a critical uh, attitude. Uh, uh, for me, in uh, my analysis, uh, what helped of these documents was my experience of oral history. In oral history, you cannot and should not uh, look for uh, uh, exact facts about uh, 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 remembering, but what is there is the assessment, evaluation of events. And uh, uh, I remember uh, the these uh, recordings and remembrance. So uh, all the uh, memory about the first Soviets were basically by nature anti-Soviet. Uh, people don't uh, realize that because the Soviet uh, power, uh, the Soviet style government uh, goes on in Belarus. And when we uh, 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 hear to a person that uh, has lived through totalitarian state period and that was a person that was deprived of everything. So the state beca uh, became less totalitarian, more authoritarian. There were a bit, uh, um, a bit more freedom in the second part of the, the 20th century. But the, the things they tell about this uh, uh, regime was a strong criticism of it and helped also uh, it helped me also to have a more critical assessment of the archives of the documents so uh, the these documents were published also under the soviet belarusian republic these were reports about how many thing, good things were um, made for people how people were happy how many schools in belarusian are there and so on, how peasants were happy. Uh, but talking uh, with people, yes, um, uh, in, uh, in autumn uh, 1939, um, uh, peasants were given uh, land, but they start uh, started immediately be forced to uh, be collectivized. But uh, they introduced the Belarusian schools, but uh, immediately in 1940, they started to switch uh, schools, schools uh, into the Russian language schools. So, uh, and... Uh, I didn't work much in Belarusian art, uh, art, uh, Belarusian art um, uh, archives uh, after 2017. So the issue of the uh, unification. So the Belarusian Soviet Super Soviet uh, uh, Council takes decision in, in November um, uh, 1939. Takes decision about the unification. But what is important, even before the German aggression, the uh, uh, old Soviet Soviet uh, 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 border was there to go from Rodna to Minsk uh, before. Before 1941, one needed a special pass to go. Well, there were no unification, but really, uh, the uh, it was the German occupation that uh, united Belarusian. So uh, the Germans came uh, in, and uh, there were no longer uh, this border. Why they needed this border at that time? They needed to uh, to have repressions to implement repressions they had to limit this uh, territory to have this zone of repressions and uh, uh, on the one hand the oral history does not pretend to be an exact uh, uh, history so uh, these are memories of people uh, for whom uh, the events happened uh, 30 40 years ago and it was what uh, um, a person saw 
one that on not only what uh, their personal experience but also there was uh, um, it is affected by the collective memory by uh, some other prisms and so on but what does not change is was the exact me memory of the uh, 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 ideas but um, uh, concluding well what was there uh, went across any memories any records was anti-war character of the uh, memory the uh, war cannot be a means of solving um, problems it dominated across all uh, all histories uh, uh, you know in the uh, past uh, well you know yeah, under the soviet union there was a kind of propaganda war because each war has to be a winning war so and we have to overcome to win but in people's mind, uh, this ideology, ideology uh, didn't have any impact. People felt that there should be no war. So the combination of the archives and uh, the documents from oral history is very useful because uh, it would allow a better analysis. We should analyze these sources of oral history and also sources from the archives for have, uh, to have a better understanding. Thank you. I think this is really this is really important to um, to um, take this into account that there are not only files in uh, in archives and uh, that we also take uh, oral histories uh, into our research. Um, and um, to Dennis, I would like to stress, um, like in a moment, um, Ukraine is uh, under current attacks uh, or under attacks every day um, by the Russian um, um, army. Uh, and a, a big um, target are archives and um, and museums. So, um, what to what extent uh, what files uh, we can see in uh, in Ukrainian archives, and to what extent does it uh, do you in the moment um, are going into um, into uh, digitalizing them and breaking them away level for uh, for the for, uh, for foreigners um this is not a, a particular uh, based question for the for the for this discussion but it's like i think it's better for a better understanding to to this of the situation in in, in ukraine it is um really important to discuss this thank you thank you uh, christopher your question it seems to me that it is one of the consequences of this war that uh, Ukrainian archives and uh, museum ex exhibits with the support of European partners from 2022 uh, became more and more, uh, much more actively di digitalized and uh, to, uh, there is uh, no open access to them. And uh, when we talk about uh, the consequences of the pact, Ukrainian archives uh, of the Soviet uh, special services, they were relatively open for researchers from, from the uh, presidency of Yushchenko. So from mid uh, 2000, uh, 2000 years, and it was published uh, so, there were reports of the Minister of the State Security uh, when, um, uh, well, referring to reports from the uh, peasants, Ukrainian peasants who participated in the so-called liberation advance on the territory of the Western uh, uh, Ukraine. So, uh, they show an interesting picture of the ethnic politics of the Soviet Union. And uh, plus, uh, now uh, uh, we have a, a strong di uh, digital um, uh, work on the archives of the criminal cases after uh, uh, 1939 and their uh, Volinia archives and also uh, it linked to the uh, uh, to the archives of the um, uh, uh, of the committee of the state security and from my personal experience you can submit a request and free of charge uh, within a month to receive a copy of the case of a repressed person if um, um, it is available in this archive but of course there is another problem that 
we have only the original level of the archives which are open or so it's more uh, about the state security uh, institutions organs but many things that could shed more light on events in uh, ukraine are still preserved kept in moscow but i hope that one day they would be accessible but not now unfortunately um thank you this is uh, what we hope as well uh, all uh, researchers i think um so um i would like to stick a bit into the questions that I, that came in um some of them are not related to the to the topics that we are discussing today um but uh, maybe to uh, lucia i would like to um ask the questions about the uh, baltic way uh, in history and um yes the baltic way is the history uh, it is an event in in uh, which is um now uh, 25 25 35 years ago um so um but to what extent does it um um to nowadays um society refer um and how you interpret uh, the baltic way is it um the regaining of independence is it um the um still the loss of independence that is uh, commemorated on 23rd of august so uh, what is the maybe the commemoration date 23rd of august in in lithuania um, thank you much, very much for this uh, question. I think there are a few aspects to be taken into account. So first of all, it is a symbol of unity, I think, of people not only in Lithuania, but also in all three Baltic states. So first of all, <clears throat> a symbol of <laughs> unity and referring, I think, more to the strive for freedom and actually Gain, regaining independence than to the loss and, and victimhood. So it's a positive symbol of the unity and of hope as well. I think at least from the commemorations that are taking part uh, in the anniversaries that took part 10 years ago and, and this year. So unity, strength, resisting, and also unity in the face of the threat that also is here today. So I think it's a very it's very crucial, and I think it will persist and it will remain a symbol for for many many decades because because of, the, of this positive uh, value in it of of unity against uh, aggression. The former one and the current, the recent one. Thank you. Um, um, a question came from Viktor Shadursky, and probably this is uh, related to, um, maybe to all of you. Um, it is the question, um, if um, Nazi Germany, um, without the economic support of the, uh, um, of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, would be able to attack um, the whole Europe um, in 1931, 1940, um, and then later on also the Soviet Union in 1941. So maybe one of you as a, as a historian uh, would like to say something uh, on this issue. Maybe I should start. Uh, Frankly speaking, I think that, yes, it could attack Europe, but I should say that in Ukraine, official um, uh, logics could, could be what-if logics. Yeah, um, we, we see that uh, in uh, 1941, after the Soviet assistance stopped, uh, Germany still proceeded with these uh, uh, attacks. And uh, uh, those campaigns in 1939-41, uh, uh, they were limited in their scales on, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, I, I didn't study this in detail, but I, I saw that uh, oh, after two weeks of the Polish campaign, uh, before they are uh, entered the Soviet Union territory, uh, Germany had no um, bombs. And um, so, so you see the situation is similar. So they had um, not enough munitions. 
uh, and they spend all their munitions bef faster than uh, the generals planned. So those shortages, uh, they, they could happen. But again, I uh, say, what if? Uh, and we cannot have a direct and precise reply. I want to add that uh, I think uh, for Germany and its success uh, in war against England and France was this Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. It was it had a huge impact. They had a guarantee that there will be no uh, second front, and it was. Uh, very important for Germany. The political aspect was very important. They were sure that there will be only one front line. Uh, and after the First World War, uh, Germans had a nightmare of uh, war uh, in with two front lines. And Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact uh, was a guarantee there wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you um, for this. Um, maybe uh, I would. So in the in the chat, we don't have uh, any more questions, but I would like to ask you, uh, Lucia, Alexander, uh, Denise, maybe you have questions to each other um, about um, the cases of uh, Lithuania, um, 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 Ukraine and Belarus. So please feel free to raise them to the um, other person. Uh if I may, <laughs> yeah, sure. I think, Denise, you mentioned this, if I'm not mistaken, this uh, generational aspect. So from your research, uh, what you what you did, uh, of course, that was before the war. Uh, did you do any interviews with the youngest generation? Uh, or the family interviews or family interviews where, uh, for instance, older generations would share their memories and the youngest generation, the one without the, the, the Soviet experience, would share their views or their thoughts. Have you come across su such data from, from, from the youngest generation and their attitudes towards the past? <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Well, uh, I so uh, uh, I we didn't question, um, uh, uh, talk much about the pact. Well, my interviews from 2022 were mostly focused on the memory of the Second World War, how it was developed uh, um, in the light of the ongoing war and uh, from the personal experience of uh, the relevant people. And here it is, uh, uh, well, the differences between generations uh, are felt. Of course, uh, all the people, they of course uh, are, are more uh, under the Soviet uh, narratives uh, influence, but uh, even they have uh, a deep change, the rejection of this Soviet vision and the adoption of new frameworks that started to be in place in Ukraine from 2014. So, uh, uh, so I have this my uh, remark that it was very significant. So. Uh, we uh, often refer to uh, different opinion polls in Ukraine and so on. One of the markers was how people name this war, either the Great Patriotic War, Patriotic war or the uh, Second World War. So uh, what I felt, people from the older generation, uh, 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 of around 50 plus or 50 uh, less, so uh, they uh, mentioned the uh, great uh, uh, patriotic war. But, so they they blame the Soviet Union, they criticize the Soviet Union. But uh, when we ask what does it mean, uh, the great patriotic war, their answer is that we were taught such way in, uh, uh, in, uh, in schools. That's it. Can I add, please? Uh, I, I, I finished. 
the Belarusian situation, well, uh, uh, answering uh, Lu uh, Lucia's question, we uh, uh, observed a split, a uh, uh, disruption of this memory. We uh, uh, we take uh, memories, uh, uh, record memories of the uh, of the uh, old la lady, and we uh, well uh, her um, uh, uh, grandchildren came and they were surprised. Um, they hear that for the first time. They ask her, "Why haven't you shared that with us?" They do not share the information, but because these memories can. Uh, create unpleasant situations for their kids or for their uh, uh, grandchildren. So, and uh, our experience, uh, so our expeditions were a, an important occasion uh, um, from this social point of view, socializing point of view. People felt uh, that they are important, their memory was important. So they, uh, uh, the fact that they were recorded uh, listened to that they felt uh, uh, their agencies that they uh, the things that they lived through it was a life uh, um, changing to some extent experience so somebody came uh, comes uh, uh, to uh, assess their memories and this factor of this disruption of Belarusian memory is very obvious and this is a, an awful cruel situation unfortunately Yeah, thank you for this uh, for this uh, interacting discussion. Um, I think it gave another another really good uh, point in in our discussion uh, of today's evening. And um, actually, the time is running, and um, we are close to our uh, our final time. We set us a limit of ninety minutes. And um, if there are no further questions, I would um, I would close uh, our discussion here on this uh, point. Um, I would like to um, say that we I think we we just um, um went through a lot of issues uh, tonight uh, it was the issue of uh, of the of the events uh, in this in this time 1939 1940 it was how it was remembered how it is remembered today how did, how what uh, what for an impact does it have on uh, on societies on politics and um also um on different uh, parts of the society and um i think this was a kind of an uh, Par force uh, um, through all this um, these uh, issues and um, but nevertheless I would like to um, continue this discussion uh, and hopefully we can do this uh, in personal um, somehow some when um, uh, but for now I would like to uh, thank you um, um, the participants um, Dennis uh, Alexander and Lucia. Uh, for this really uh, interesting and inspiring talks and uh, discussion that we had today. Um, I would like to uh, thank also um, the Forum for Historical Bela uh, Belarus uh, Science um, and there especially Alessia and uh, Lisaveta um, for organizing this ev event here and uh, this evening. And um, the biggest thank uh, as always goes uh, to the interpreters um, because without them it wouldn't be uh, possible to have such a dis uh, discussion and um, many thanks to you uh, both and uh, you um, gave us a uh, really help uh, to understand each other um, so um, this is it from my side um, Alexander I think you want to say some word um, some last word or if um, not, then I would. Um, I would like to thank or express my gratitude for uh, organizing this discussion. I think that it is very important. I was first uh, uh, surprised why don't we have uh, polls, but uh, later I realized that uh, uh, Poland, uh, uh, Ukraine, and Lithuania uh, uh, have uh, or, uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and uh, Lithuania have something in common. Uh, many things unite, unite us because for Poland everything is clear, and in our case, it is not uh, so uh, univocal. Yes, this is a good word for the end. Um, and um, but uh, nevertheless, I would like to say also something. Uh, one word at the end. Um, I would hope for a better future for us all. Um, that means uh, in the case of Ukraine that you will win this war and that it soon will be over. In the case of Belarus, that uh, you will free from this dictatorship and uh, you will have also a brighter future. Um, and you can uh, see the, the the past with um, other eyes. 
So um, this is uh, this is it for um, for our evening, and I'm thanking you all that you participated in this uh, in this webinar. And I would be glad if we can have a conversation in the nearest future about this issue again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation and for the discussion and the organizers for the same concept. Thank very much uh, for all, to all of you for your participation and many thanks for organizers for uh, organizing this uh, discussion. I hope that uh, in the uh, uh, near future we will have opportunities to meet in person elsewhere in Ukraine, in Ukraine without uh, any security threats, but also in, um, uh, in Minsk as well. This is my sincere wishes to all of us. Also from my side, thank you very much for, for organization of this discussion and for all the participants. And uh, let's hope to meet again, maybe in, in some conferences or, 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 or online. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>